so geeked right now. It's Wednesday night, I'm leaving the gym. It's about 9.15, starving. Haven't eaten since like, I don't know, one maybe? No gains there. But it's testing week for my crew, for the power crew, B squad. And so far, so many PRs. I mean, PR city. I got 30 pound squat PRs, 20 pound bench PRs, Two of my ladies hit the 135 pound club. One of my guys, shout out Nick Chan, hit the 300 pound club. Shit's off the chain. I love it. I love it so much. Um, not to mention, about three weeks out from the Bourbon Barrel Bash, uh, USPA meet, we got eight people competing. I'm not even competing. I'm coaching that day. I didn't compete because I'm gonna coach. And I'm so excited. I'm more excited than if I was competing. Got eight competing. Four of them, no, five of them, it's their first meet. First meet. And I think everyone's going to qualify for the Kentucky State in December, which we're hosting at Everyday Athletes. I just can't be more excited than what I am right now. This is, this is what I live for. All day, nigga. compete there are a few things you need to know and think about before you schedule and compete in your first powerlifting competition number one when where and who with there are a ton of federations uh, all across the country and the world uh, that run powerlifting meets the thing for you is to figure out which one's going to fit you best the three that I recommend would be the USPA the USAPL or RPS. The reason I choose these three is just because of experience and the things I've seen and done. They run the smoothest, they're the most organized, and the meets themselves are very efficient. Plus, uh, the USPA and the RPS, they're very frequent in terms of meets. The USPA is the fastest growing uh, organization in the country, and they run meets all over all year long, uh, so it should be pretty easy to find one that would be close to you that you'd be able to compete in. As far as the RPS, they're more northeast, but they're moving towards the south and towards the west, so they're really growing at a pretty good rate as well. Um, so you should be able to find something in that organization uh, near you as well. The other thing I like about USPA, USAPL, and RPS is they're all very organized in terms of their website and their classifications. So each of those federations have qualifying meets that you can compete in such as nationals and worlds and state meets and each of those you have to hit a certain qualifying total to move on to that meet. The websites of these organizations are very clear cut in explaining what they need and what you need and how to achieve that and how to set up and sign up for another meet and so on and so forth. So the fact that they're very clear cut and organizational is just great in my opinion because it makes it easier for us lifters and us coaches to figure out exactly what we need and exactly where we're going. Once you've picked your organization that you want to compete through, now we have to find a meet. So you want to look at the time frame and the location. So time frame, you want to make sure you give yourself enough time to train, prepare, and peak for this meet. And then location, you want to make sure it's somewhere close to you or somewhere that you want to go as a destination trip. Time frame is definitely most important because if you haven't really been trained for a powerlifting meet, then you want to make sure you give yourself enough time to start to practice the lifts and then peak those lifts so that you can be at your best on competition day. I usually recommend if you haven't been training for powerlifting to give yourself a good four to five months just to really get some training under your belt and some practice of the three movements because there are standards to each movement. Now, if you've been training powerlifting for a while, then you know a six to eight week peak would be substantial as well. So it just kind of depends on where you're at in your training. Now that we've picked a federation and we've picked a meet that we're gonna compete at and we've got all our travel plans set up, the next thing you need to think about is hiring a coach. I say this because there's a lot that goes into not only the coaching of each lift but the training and the periodization of the program and also the preparation for the day of. It's nice to have someone there who can remind you what you need, 
what you need to get ready for, what you need to do the day of, the rules, uh, each lift call, so on and so forth. So making sure that you have somebody there that can guide you so it takes some of the stress off of your shoulders and some of the thinking out of your brain. Let's talk equipment. So as far as the necessities, we need shoes, we need deadlift socks, a singlet, and a t-shirt. Per the rules, you have to wear a t-shirt underneath your singlet for the squat and the bench. You don't have to for the deadlift, but for the other two, it's in the rules that you have to. So make sure that you just have a t-shirt. If you want to wear your team logo, then do that. Um, just make sure it doesn't have a pocket and it's not like some type of compression t-shirt. As far as the singlet goes, it, you can get one from one of the main brands like Enzer, Titan, or uh, Slingshot. Or you can just get a plain one. Uh, I personally, my first meet, I got a plain black singlet off of Amazon.com. I think it cost me $35. So whatever it may be, you just want to make sure that the legs come around mid-thigh. That you can't get them to the knees and they can't be little booty shorts. Also, you just need to make sure that it is snug fitting, not too tight, but snug fitting so that the judges can see what they need to see. And that's the whole purpose of wearing the singlet. As far as shoes go, I recommend for squatting and deadlifting flat sole shoes. So something like a Converse Chuck or a Van, um, something that gives you support and is thin and low to the ground. For squatting, you can also use squat shoes. That's what I preferably use. Um, so I have Nike Romaleos, uh, Adidas makes pair, Reebok makes pair, so on and so forth. But they're just an elevated heel, so it makes it a little easier for depth. Plus they're really sturdy and really stiff so you're really anchored to the ground once you set up. As far as socks for deadlift go, it can be anything. I wear stance socks, um, but they make deadlift socks. I think Socks Box is the company, um, as well as you could just get some soccer socks. The biggest thing is that you need them to be to the upper shin, so they have to be above the calf. They cannot be touching the knee, but they have to cover the shin. So these socks right here, they would not cut it. They're not long enough. So as far as accessories that we can use that you don't have to use, but you know, I recommend using, um, these would include a belt, knee sleeves, and wrist wraps. So, we'll start with wrist wraps first. Wrist wraps, mainly used for bench, but you can also use them for squat or deadlift. Some people do that. Um, they just give a little support on the wrist and keep you from being flimsy. So as far as these go, check the rules. It's a little different in every federation but you want to make sure they're not too thick and not too long. So check those rule books and see exactly where you're at. Make sure your wraps fit. But something simple, this is Elite FTS. Rogue makes a great pair. Um, something simple that you can just use for training as well as your competition. The second thing would be the knee sleeves. There's a ton of brands out there as well. Um, these are the Slingshot Strong Sleeves. I really like these. They're pretty similar to the SVDs, but what they do is give great support for your knees. They give you a little bit of rebound at the bottom of your squat, um, but more than anything, they give compression and support. A lot of these companies make sleeves that fit the rule book for these federations. Uh, double check just to make sure, but again, most of them try to manufacture to fit the standards. And the third piece, the one I recommend the most, will be your weightlifting belt. So. Squat and deadlift, this is going to give you some extra stability in the midsection for your lower back, but it also gives you uh, rigidity that will help you add a couple pounds to your lifts. When it comes to the belt and the rules, you want to make sure that the thickness is no more than 13 millimeters. Uh, this is a 10 mil millimeter belt, and I think this is a little more doable for most people than the 13 millimeter. The 13 gets pretty thick, and it makes it hard to get comfortable and get used to. Um, the other thing is you want to make sure that it's a powerlifting belt and that that thickness runs all the way down. So you'll see a weightlifting belt, they kind of taper off here at the end down by the, by the holes, but uh, a good leather powerlifting belt will continue that thickness all the way through. Again, make sure you train with this before you use it for a competition because it takes something to get used to and there is a proper way to use it. So now you've got a coach and you've been training. Next, we need to talk about the weekend of and the day of. So besides USAPL, most, uh, most federations have a 24-hour weigh-in 
So they'll do weigh-ins Friday morning and Friday evening, as well as Saturday morning of the competition. This is nice because it allows you to really cut if you need to cut to a weight class, and then gives you time to refeed and make sure you're full of energy the day of. If you're competing in USAPL, then they only do day of weigh-ins, so that means you kind of have to walk around at your weight class, or you might have some strength issues whenever you try to cut the day of. At weigh-ins, this is the time where the judges are going to check your equipment, they're going to do a weigh-in, and then they're also going to get your rack heights. So whether they're using just the squat stands or a monolift, they're going to get your squat height for the rack and then your bench height for the rack as well. Depending on the crowd, weigh-ins usually take about 30 minutes to an hour. Um, again, it's a equipment check, then we weigh in, we get your weight in your weight class, get your rack heights, and then you're out the door and ready to go grub. As far as which weigh-in to go to, that's just going to depend on your schedule. Again, if you're trying to cut to a weight class, I recommend that 24-hour Friday morning weigh-in because that gives you that gets it done quick and then you can go eat and feel good again because if you've been cutting all week you're gonna feel pretty crappy. But if you're not trying to cut a weight class then whichever one fits your schedule is gonna be the best. As far as cutting to a weight class, if it's your first meet, I don't really think it's that important. That's just personal opinion. Uh, it's, it's just about getting a, a competition under your belt, getting the experience, and then we can look at cutting to a specific weight class to make numbers or make records or whatever it may be. The only time I would say that if it is a first meet and you're thinking about cutting is if it's not that far off and you're looking to qualify for another meet, maybe a state or a national or a world meet. So then it's a little more important to cut. At weigh-ins, you also have to give your openers. So if you have a coach, then the openers will probably be up to him or her. Uh, they'll help you out with that. If you don't, then we gotta look at what to open with. So this is pretty important because you don't wanna pick an opener too high and then you bomb out and then you don't even get to complete the meet. Because if you don't make a lift on a squatter bench, then you don't get to move on to the next. So when picking your openers, just make sure that you're picking something that you're comfortable with, that you could do even on a bad day, and that isn't too far off of where you want to be so you don't have to take a 150 pound jump from your opener to your third attempt. So now it's the day of, it's competition day. We've been prepping for months, we've been working hard, we've been eating right, now it's the day to show off. My biggest recommendations for the day of is this. Make sure you're early. It's better to be early than to be late, I promise you that. Plus, if you're in an early flight, maybe the first or second, you want to make sure you have plenty of time to warm up. For someone who takes a little longer to warm up, maybe they need extra foam rolling or stretching because it's 8 a.m. in the morning and they're used to lifting at 4 p.m. at night, then that's definitely something to take into consideration and make sure you're getting there in time to get a thorough warm up and make sure you're ready for your squats. Snacks. Make sure you have plenty of snacks. Simple stuff, fruits, granola bars, protein bars, uh, nuts, anything like that that's gonna be easy and quick to eat, doesn't sit heavy on your stomach, and get you plenty of protein and sugars. That's what we need throughout the day, because it's a long day. You're, you're generally gonna start around 8 a.m., and your deadlift won't be until 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So making sure you're staying energized and fed throughout the day is very important. The same with caffeine. Make sure that you stay caffeinated if that's something you do. You know, if you're used to lifting with a work with a pre-workout, then keep a pre-workout with you. I wouldn't overdose on it because then you're going to crash out. But make sure that you're using that in the morning and maybe a little in the afternoon just to give you that pick me up. If you're caffeine sensitive or you don't like caffeine, I wouldn't recommend it then because that's going to make you jittery, kind of throw you off mentally, and it might even make you feel sick. Me personally, I'm a caffeine-aholic. Uh, I love spikes on the day of competition, so I'll have a spike in the morning, and then I'll have a spike before my deadlifts as well. And mostly because I love the taste, but I love the energy. It, it gives me a little jittery, and it gets me a little hype for my big lifts. As far as the lifts themselves go, just remember this. Stay composed, do what you've been doing, and focus on you. Don't worry about who you're competing against in your weight class. Don't worry about any records. Just do what you've been doing. I promise you there's a big crowd there, but you're not gonna notice it. 
I was nervous as hell in my first meet because I thought this huge crowd, it was going to throw me off. When I got up to the squat stand, I did not notice anyone but the head judge and myself. That was it. And I promise it'll probably be the same for you. So when you get up there, just focus on the lift. Think about your checklist. Think about what you need to do on the lift. Think about your form and go from there. I promise once you get that first squat in, it'll be smooth sailing the rest of the day and it'll start to become fun. I know nerves are one of the biggest things I see with all my new lifters in their first competition, uh, but every one of them, once they get that first squat under their belt, they smooth down and they feel a lot better after that and they have fun. That's what it's all about, it's having fun. So if you've been thinking about, even thinking about doing a meet, sign up. Find one, find a federation, find a coach and sign up. That's step one. Once you've signed up, you can't back out and now we can really start to push yourself into the future and start seeing some achievements, setting goals, and doing things again that you never even expected you could do. They just spent like two or three weeks out the country. Them boys up to something, they just not just bluffing. You don't have to call, I hear my dance like Usher. Ooh. I just found my tempo like on DJ Mustard. Ooh. I hit that Ginobili with my left hand, all like, woo. Lobster and Celine for all my babies that I miss.